thank you. Uh, stay with me. There are about 30 slides on this one, so, so 30 slides, 10 minutes. Uh, very <laughs> So I'm, I'm Theo Manet, I'm a professor in the biomedical engineering department. I have an appointment in the physics department. I'm going to tell you, although my thunder is kind of just almost stolen by the introduction of all this uh, new old material that we've come to love very much. Um, and so this new old material is something that has, is a material that has very, um, a very good attitude. It, uh, uh, it could, and it could impact high technology, you know, material science, medicine, global health, and health report statement. So how's, how's that for a bold statement? Um, and uh, so what are the features of this, of this material? It's uh, sustainable, it uh, can be processed in water, um, and it's uh, processed in water at room temperature, in fact. It's biodegradable with a clock, so you can program it to, dis to dissolve instantaneously or to be stable over years. Um, it's edible. Uh, you can implant it in the human body and it's technological, so it can have uh, uh, microelectronic or nanoscale interfaces. Um, and it looks, uh, it looks like this. So, uh, so you, see, you see it here, very transparent, and, um, and so the, the reaction is here. It's clearly a big deal, it's plastic. Um, but in fact, <laughs> in fact uh, it's, um, we're more used to seeing it like, like this. So the constituents of this material actually, this plastic-like looking material, this is silk. And uh, this is made out of water and protein. Sure. It doesn't turn on. There it does turn on. There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go through that again. Uh, but, uh, but so the constituents of this film then are, are just water and protein. And so, um, and so the question is, uh, how do you reinvent something that, is, that has been around for 5,000 years? So where, what, uh, we, what we do is, uh, is we, uh, we take inspiration from, uh, from, from nature in general and, and you, you kind of marvel at the, way, um, at the way that the silkworm that you see here is spinning, is spinning its fiber. And, uh, and the silkworm does this uh, for protection that has been kind of beat out of him out of, from, from evolution. Uh, for 5,000 years of evolution, they don't need to really protect themselves anymore. But, uh, but it's still instilled in the, in, in, in the process of spinning the cocoon. When the silkworm spins the cocoon, it actually, it actually uh, spins this incredible material that is very, very tough and comparable to technical fibers like Kevlar. For example, so um, so we, you know in the, the reverse engineering process that we're familiar with is that uh, the, the textile industry is very familiar with is to take this cocoon and unwind it and get the fibers and then weave very glamorous things. Um, we uh, want to figure out what happens in the silkworm gland. So silkworm starts with water and protein and builds this Kevlar-like thing. And so we would like to know um, how to go back to the water and silk solution that the silkworm has. In, in its gland and use that as a starting block to, uh, uh, to build, so have our liquid Kevlar, if you will. And this is a key insight that, uh, that came about two decades ago by, from, from somebody that I am extremely fortunate to, to work with pretty much on a, on a daily basis, 24-7, this David Kaplan, who was, uh, who was uh, 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 my, my colleague at, uh, um, uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So, uh, so what we do is then we go back to this water and protein solution. So, that, so we have the building block, if you will. And then we use this building block to make, uh, to make a variety of things. So we have this liquid Kevlar. So what do we do? Um, in order to transform it into what I showed you, then you pour it onto something and, and, we're, and, and the proteins are very smart so they find a way to self-assemble. And so basically you pour that liquid silk solution, you let it dry, and then what you get out of it is you get uh, out that film. The reason that I put here, and then, then when it's dry, you detach it, right? So uh, the reason that I put the drop here on a DVD is that I, I mentioned that silk was technological. So uh, generally when you pour the silk on something that is like the DVD and has these very small feature sizes in which you store information, um, silk has a way of drying up and following these subtle topographies, so to replicate the information that is in there. So, uh, so you, can, you can, in effect, when, when that film dries up, store information in there because, because you're encoding information on, a nano, on, on the nanoscale, and so you can build things like this. So these clear films that actually encode some messages that, like the DVD, you can read out optically. So let's see if it works. So you can write, you know, things like digital optics in Chinese or make images of eyes and, 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 and things like that. So this is, again, water protein thanks to the nano patterning, and you can do these types of things. And, um, and it, gets, it gets a little, a little artistic. You know, you can, do, you can do more formats and you go a little bit nuts, so you can make, you know, kind of reflective tape, like the reflective tape that goes on your shoe. Why would you want to do that? But um, uh, you can make very beautiful holograms. This you can't see. If you're interested, I can show you outside. 
in the sun, but, the, but this is the size of that hologram, so you can add three dimensions by doing that topography and really encoding more complex information. Um, it assumes a very different format, so you can, uh, you can guide light through it, so you can make optical fibers that are, that are all made of protein, uh, or if you're afraid to go to the doctor and actually get, uh, um, get injections, you can make microneedle arrays, what you see superimposed on this microneedle array is a human hair, just to give you a sense of size. Uh, you can make bigger things like like nuts and bolts and and, and blocks. So they're all organic. So you could probably buy them at, at Whole Foods uh, someday. Uh, and those gears work also in water. So they're so so they're good for varied environments. So it's uh, so it's particularly important uh, these things. If you you if you want something that is strong, then you can use the material properties of that liquid kev Kevlar to reform things that are. Uh, that can substitute peripheral veins, like small uh, vein replacement for tissue engineering applications like you heard from Pam earlier, or you can make bigger things. You can actually make bone replacements and you can make them, uh, you can make them on, on, on a larger scale. Uh, you can do other things like cups. Um, <laughs> if you add gold or if you, get, or if you add semiconductors, you can make sensors that interface, for example, with food. You see there uh, a conformal sensor that is on the surface of a banana. Or you can make electronics that are very unusual and that wrap and conform to, uh, to tissue or to the human, or to the human body or enter, or enter inside living environments. Um, or for fashion forward people, you can do LED <laughs> tattoos. Um, and this is an LED array on silk. But you know, so, yeah, so you see that there's, a, there's very, very much versatility in the material formats that you can do with silk. But, why would you want to do these things with silk, really? really because uh, is, where, where are the unique uh, advantages of using silk? So I would say, the I mentioned that it's biocompatible and biodegradable, so you can implant these things uh, into the body without need, need to retrieve them. So in principle, all the, all the things that you've seen before could go inside the body without, uh, without having to recuperate them. So what you see here, actually this thing that is, uh, that is, that is indicated here is a, is a tissue cross-section of that reflective tape that goes inside, inside the shoes. And what happens here is like when you're seen at night when you're jogging, by a car in the dark, then you see deeper layers of tissue if you implant this, if you implant this mirror and you shine a light on them. So it enables you to see deeper inside living, living tissue. Um, or is the reintegration in the body is not the only thing. You can have reintegration in the environment. So really, literally, what you see here, this silk cup that, that I hold in my hand, then you could use to drink, to drink some coffee and maybe throw it away in the environment and not worry about the fact that your landfill, uh, then your landfill is compromised for hundreds of years so you can eliminate of the detrimental effects, say, of, of polystyrene cups. Um, it's edible, it doesn't taste great, uh, but it's edible, and so you have avenues for smart packaging and all these things where you can conform to tissue and actually have the, uh, to, to the surfaces of fruits, and you can have the surfaces of fruits actually give you information about food contaminants. I think the most important thing that is remarkable is that you come full circle with the, with, with the cocoon quality, if you will. Um, that recipe where you, where you poured and you waited for the silk to dry, now if you take the silk solution and you add things to the silk solution where these things are proteins or enzymes or antibodies or vaccines, then what happens is that silk actually acts as a cocoon for these materials during the self-assembly process. The biological activity of these things are, is, is maintained. So, um, so it makes the materials biologically active and environmentally interactive. So what, uh, for example, the screw that you, that, that you saw before can actually contain a drug and can be used to repair a bone and at the, at the same time to re deliver therapeutics. Or you could, do, you could think of things like putting drugs in your wallet. And so, and so you can make the silk cars like the ones that I showed before where you, you embed vaccines that need no refrigeration. So we've demonstrated that we can stabilize penicillin at, uh, at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, at 60 degrees C for two months without loss of efficacy, which is a good alternative, for example, for delivery in places where <laughs> that, need, that need the solar power refrigerated camels in terms of global health issues. And unfortunately, that's, that's, very, that's, that's very hilarious, but, but that's, that's, that's real. Um, and so, uh, uh, and the final thing is that you can store, but you need also to, to recuperate, and so the controllable uh, the controllable degradability of the materials is very important. You see there on the top row a film that is programmed to degrade and the bottom of a film that is programmed to elute the drug so that you can recuperate what is inside the film. And so this is, this is good to control the reintegration clock in the environment or to control the reintegration clock inside the body uh, to, 
deliver the drug. So we, we like to, to call this our thread of discovery, and so, and so maybe our thread of discovery is really a thread. And so uh, our, our, our claim is that you know, whether you want to replace a vein or a bone or build a sensor, be more sustainable for microelectronics or photonics, um, you know, drink coffee without guilt so that you can throw the cup away, uh, carry the antibiotics in your pocket or deliver them inside the body or maybe deliver them across the, the desert, this might be the magical material that can do it. Thanks.